Hi, my name is Matt. Welcome to Walk Wild. Today I'm going to be telling you how to walk the Pembrokeshire Coast Path. Now, before I get started, there's going to be a lot of things I mentioned in the video and I can't possibly cover all the information. So I'm going to include some links to other resources in the description down below. As always, if you've enjoyed the video, can you please like and subscribe and show your support? So where to start? The Pembrokeshire Coast Path is 186 miles long. It's in the southwest of Wales, which is in the UK, and it runs from St Dog Mills, which is in the northern part, to Amroth, which is in the southern part. But I recommend walking it the other way around, which is from Amroth in the south to St Dog Mills in the north, mainly because the harder section is around St Dog Mills and you want to finish with that most difficult section rather than starting with it. It's a very challenging hike and it covers 35,000 feet of ascents and descents, which is the same height as Mount Everest. So it's an extremely challenging hike and you're going to go through 58 beaches and 14 harbours over about a two week period. But it's also immensely beautiful and that's the main reason people do it. And it's some of the most gorgeous coastline in the whole of the UK. The Welsh actually have a nickname for it and they call it the Land of Mystery and Enchantment. I'm not even going to try and say what that is in Welsh, but that's what the locals call it and it's very apt, I think, considering how beautiful it is. So yeah, as I said, it's very ch challenging and I, I ended up losing two kilograms of body weight when I was hiking it. What you need to consider is whether or not you're going to hike it all at once or whether you want to split it up into sections, maybe over a year or even two years. Yeah, so number two how to get there. This area of Wales is really quite remote and it's not particularly close to, well, anything. Cardiff and Swansea are the two biggest transport hubs where you can get flights to and from there and also get trains from London to either Cardiff or Swansea. If you're going to Amroth to start, then what you need to do is you need to take a train from Cardiff to Kilgetty and from there you can take a bus to Amroth. When you've walked the trail and at the end, you can then walk a mile south of St Dog Mills which is where Cardigan is and from Cardigan you take a bus to Carmarthen and then Carmarthen you take a train to Swansea or Cardiff and then on to wherever else you're going. So as you can see it's a pretty complicated procedure and you need to really think it through. Um, there are also some coastal buses that you can take which go between different towns along the way and that can be really useful to utilise that if you're walking in sections. How to find your way around? The Pembrokeshire Coast Path goes through the Pembrokeshire Coast National Park and it is a fairly large area but it's very well signposted. National trails are the people who look after the path and their symbol is an acorn and what they do is they put that acorn on every signpost so that you can just follow the acorns and you'll be able to walk the whole path. In addition to this there's also the Welsh Coast Path which is 870 miles long, goes all the way around the Welsh coast and their symbol is a shell and it actually follows the same segment as the Pembrokeshire Coast Path. So if you follow an acorn or a shell, you're going to be able to find your way around. Also, a fairly easy tip is to just keep the sea on your left at all times and you won't get lost. You need to be a bit careful with following signs for the Pembrokeshire Coast National Park because there are different walks and some of them do head inland a bit. So make sure you're following the Pembrokeshire Coast Path rather than the National Park. You can use an OS map. I didn't. I didn't find it was necessary. Maps can be useful if you want to know where the nearest town is, where the next water stop is and that kind of thing. Um, but in general, the signposts are really well looked after. And if you follow them, you should be fine. Where to stay? I'm a big fan of wild camping and I always have been. And I really wanted to wild camp as much of this trail as I could. Uh, it's not technically legal in England and Wales is the only issue. So you need to be really careful about how you decide to do it. Firstly, you want to arrive late and leave early. Next is that you want to be discreet. Don't camp on the path or don't jump over a fence into a farmer's field, that kind of thing. Try and be out of the way a bit. And then the next is you want to leave no trace. So you don't want any evidence that you were there. Don't light any fires. Don't have any music playing. Um, don't trample over any vegetation, that kind of thing. When you're in the northern section of the path, it's very remote and isolated and there's loads of places to wild camp up there. I did six days there and then I also did six days in campsites. There are so many great campsites along the way. Everything from a camper van or trailer park down to just walk in, pitching on a bit of grass. So the whole way along the path, I recommend camping if possible. Um, you can stay in Air an Airbnb or any kind of hotel at some of the bigger places like Saundersfoot, Tenby, Pembroke, Milford Haven, Broadhaven, Fishguard. But 
that's not that many places and some of those are clustered close together so you will probably have to be in a campsite for at least some of this trail. Next is what to pack. Because it's on the Irish Sea you want to make sure you have waterproofs with you. You know it brings in a lot of damp weather, cold weather coming off that sea and you don't want to be caught out without any uh, protection from the bad weather so definitely bring some waterproofs. It, in the sun, summer it can still get very hot and it's quite exposed so you want to make sure you have a sun hat, sunglasses, sun cream as well. You want to have uh, some breathable layers so don't go for just purely cotton you want to have synthetic blends of clothing which means they dry quickly and wick away moisture and I think for this trail you want to be wearing trainers or trail running shoes. Boots will be way too clunky. There are no marshes or bogs to contend with. It's mainly just dry, rocky trails. And you want something light and breathable that's not gonna give you loads of blisters and trail running shoes are exactly that. The next important thing to bring is a water filter. I can't stress this enough. There is not that many places to fill up water along the trail and you need to have a filter. Occasionally you can walk past the shops and cafes and get water bottles from there, but in general, you're probably gonna need to fill up from uh, public toilets, from even taps by campsites, which might need a filter. Um, I actually had to use a like a hose on the side of like a farm a couple of times. It really is not that easy to get water. You can't just obviously get it from the sea and there's a few streams, but they've generally got agricultural runoff in them and that sort of thing. So you probably don't wanna be drinking out of those. Um, you really need to plan Make sure you have one and a half to two litres of water per day at minimum. I mean, sometimes more. There was a, an occasion when I only had 500 mils of water and I couldn't find any taps and I had to set up camp for the night and, you know, make that water last. I couldn't cook food and the next day I couldn't cook breakfast and that was just not a good position to be in. So you don't want to be rationing your water that much. You always want to think, oh, if there's a cafe or somewhere, fill up while you can. What are you going to see? This is some of the most beautiful coastline in the whole of the UK. Many of the beaches don't have names or, well, they're not properly signposted and they're kind of hidden little coves which are extremely beautiful and you, you look down on them and you wonder if anyone's ever been there. But some of the other beaches are they're more famous, they're actually award winning, they've been used for films like Harry Potter and um, Robin Hood, that kind of thing. Some of the most famous ones are Freshwater West, Barrafundal Bay, New Gale and White Sands. There are also a couple of islands that are really famous, Skoma Island and Ramsey Island. You can take boats to get out to those as well. And they have one RSPB bird nesting sites. That's another thing is the wildlife is incredible. When I was there in autumn, I actually saw seal pups. I just saw seals everywhere, which was so special. In the UK, just seeing that was just, I must have seen hundreds, honestly. You can also see porpoises, loads of uh, birds in general. Wildlife is absolutely stunning and the nature in this area is really, really amazing is it safe as i mentioned before the tides are something you want to take into consideration you don't want to get caught out on a sandbar and the tides coming in so you need to be aware that this is a very tidal area and the waves and water line changes a lot the next thing is probably the crumbling cliffs so this is a coast path and that means that you are going to be walking next to some pretty steep precipitous drops national trails are aware of this and they make sure that they kind of divert around areas that have had recent landslips and all that sort of thing, but you still need to be aware that there are tripping hazards and you could fall and you know injuries are uh, a possibility there. The next one is exhaustion or just general injury from overexertion. Because of how far this walk is and how challenging it is, it can take a really, really big toll on your body and you want to be prepared for that. So you need to look after your body and just pay attention to any pain you're getting and to just look after yourself really. So where to eat? There are some really nice cafes and pubs and bars along the way. You can stop in a few places, get some fish and chips, get a burger, a uh, hot chocolate, a pint of ale, that kind of thing. But they're not that common and it, it's not like you're walking past somewhere every hour. Sometimes you have to plan it out, maybe you only pass one place a day, if that. So majority of the time you want to be bringing your own food with you to cook in the campsite or to cook on your stove when you're wild camping. There weren't that many places to restock food. One was Asda and Pembroke Dock, the other was Tesco and Milford Haven, and then the Londis in Broadhaven. Those were the three places I stocked up and each time I brought enough food and water for a few days if possible, just to make sure I wouldn't run out. And that meant my bag was a bit more heavy, but there were only three places in nearly 186 miles that I could stock up, so it was good to have them. 
Next is my day by day itinerary. Um, I'm not going to go through every single day for that. You can look at the travel guide that's on my website in the link below, but just a bit of a uh, background to that. It did take me eight to 10 hours of hiking each day and 13 days to walk. So it was very challenging, you know, 13 and a half marathons back to back is pretty extraordinary. And, um, with a big backpack on, it's very tiring and it's worth planning out. Are you going to be able to do this or do you want to take more time doing it? Maybe 15 days is probably a better amount of time to walk it in, just so you don't put your body under too much pressure. And lastly are some bonus tips. So as I mentioned, the tides are something that's worth uh, keeping an eye out for. There are two places that I remembered where I crossed over areas which are impassable at high tide. That was at Sandy Haven and Newport. If you don't take those crossings at low tide, then you're gonna have to take a diversion a couple of miles inland and that can actually add a lot, lot of distance to your day, or if you wait for the tide to get low again, you might be waiting there for hours. So bear that in mind. Um, the next is to stretch. And I ended up stretching about 30 minutes each morning and 30 minutes in the evening, and then throughout the day as well. Um, I was doing yoga as well to just try and loosen up my muscles and my ligaments and just reduce any strains I was having. And I found it really helped. I'm not sure I'd have been able to do it if I wasn't taking my stretching really seriously on the way, just to stop my muscles freezing up and that kind of thing. Uh, it was very important. The next is to only pack essentials. So you want your bag to be as light as you possibly can get it. If it's heavy and it's bulky, you're gonna be feeling every step of it over the two weeks and it can really impact your enjoyment. So you want it to be as light as you can get it and you may have to invest in some more expensive items to bring the weight down, but if that's what it takes, I would do it. So make sure you are carrying very light gear, definitely, uh, un I mean, under 15 kilos if you can. A 45 litre bag is probably as big as you wanna go. There are some luggage services that you can do which take your bag from point to point, which may be worth looking into. But um, if you're carrying it along the way, make sure it's light. And then the last point is to just take a rest day. Yeah, that really helped. I was feeling a pain in my shoulder and I needed some time to rest, I needed to wash some clothes, have a shower, um, and I needed to just get, you know, get some more food, get my things together. And that was really important. And having that rest day helped me a lot. And so, yeah, that's everything. I hope you guys enjoyed the video. Check the description for all the links. And if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to ask me. Enjoy this hike. It's absolutely amazing. It's one of my favorite hikes in the whole of the UK. And yeah, good luck.